We have been in a series called Fresh Wind, talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's been amazing to see how the Holy Spirit is the breath of God, breathing new life into our souls, even in the midst of such a difficult season. And I'm just losing my mind excited today because there is a voice in our church who wants to join up with what God is doing in this Fresh Wind series. Sadie Robertson Huff is a voice that God is using in the Big C Church all over the world. It is not an understatement to say that her voice is reaching millions and millions of people for the glory of God. And her and her husband Christian were a part of our church at the beginning of this year. And I wanted so bad for her voice to get the opportunity to join up with what God was doing here. And it just worked out so perfectly that in the midst of a global pandemic, she is going to get to join up with what God is doing here. So can you do me a favor, from right where you are, can you give the biggest ACC welcome to Sadie Robertson Huff, bringing the Word of God today, all about the Spirit of God. It's going to be so powerful. I can't wait to see what God does. Come on. we doing online how's everybody doing out there I know it's been a crazy year but don't we know that we need church right now that we need Jesus right now we definitely need the Holy Spirit and a fresh wind right now and so I am so excited to step into this moment I'm honestly just excited to be in a church building this is like such a blessing um so I'm pumped first I just want to pray and then I'm just going to step out of the way and let let God move God I thank you so much for this incredible, incredible day, God. I thank you so much for Pastor Miles and Courtney who are head of ACC and just the whole team that's here. God, I thank you for how they lead and how they have a banner over their church that Jesus wins. God, even stepping into this place, you get hope, you get life, you get peace because you get you. God, I pray that during this series of Fresh Wind, God, you would truly move on this campus of Auburn, this city, God, this state, this country, this world with a fresh wind of your spirit. God, you have the power to do what no one else in this room can do. You have the power to change lives. You have the power to revive a year like 2020. So God, I pray that you would come do it. God, I pray that you would have your way. God, I pray that this word would fall on good soil and that there would be an urgency to take this word into their life, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that you have like the best pastors ever? I just have to say that first, because we got to give honor where honor is due. Miles and Courtney, you guys are amazing. I was honored to actually get to go to ACC for a few months with Christian. We loved it here. And he asked me to preach whenever we first got here, and I said, can I just go to church here? Like, I love it. Like, I just love it. And then one day, one day when it's right, and this could not be more of a right moment. Um, Obviously, this year is not what we thought it would be at all, but we do know that God is still good that God is still real, God is still alive, Jesus still rose from the grave, the Holy Spirit is still active and alive, and so I'm excited to preach about that. The Holy Spirit, when it's talked about in the Bible, it's talked about and it's translated to the word ruha. Everybody say ruha, because I know you all wanted to say it, because when I learned that, I was like, that is such a good word, ruha. It's very cool. But anyways, it's translated that, and what it means is it means it's God's personal presence or the energy of God's presence. It's the same word that was translated for the way that the clouds move or the way that the trees move. So it's kind of also translated as the energy of the wind, which is kind of cool when you think about this series being the fresh wind. It's literally, we're talking about the wind of God, if you haven't picked that up, the wind of the personal presence of God, the Holy Spirit that ruha, that personal presence. And Miles has talked to us a little bit about what the Holy Spirit has meant. I won't say a little bit, a lot. I've been tracking with this series and it's changed my life personally. Me and Christian have just been mind blown every week. So if you haven't watched the last two weeks, go watch the last two weeks. Because a lot of what I'm saying is recapping that and then kind of going through a story in Acts 27 of where all of this kind of plays out. But many of you, you might not have known what the Holy Spirit was before this series. Honestly, I didn't understand the Holy Spirit at all until I was like 17 years old. And even then, I was like, what's happening? Uh, I grew up in a more traditional church, and then I went to this summer camp, and everybody was just worshiping, heart abandoned. They were just going for it. And I was like, 
what's going on? <laughs> like, can we just stand here and like maybe snap? Like, I was just like, what's happening? But then somebody came up to me, they're like, hey, just let the spirit move. Just let the spirit move in your life. And I, I didn't even know what that meant. I have no concept for really what that meant. I knew God was awesome. I knew Jesus died for our sins, but I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. And in this moment, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna let it go. I'm just gonna let the spirit move. And I just began to weep. And I just began to feel God's presence. And it was so powerful when worship actually began to usher in the presence of God for me. The Holy Spirit is the energy of God's presence. Some of you might have been afraid of the Holy Spirit because you've heard different things. But Miles has recapped it so beautifully. Some of the highlights from the last week I just wrote down, it says the Holy Spirit, he comes to set you free. The Holy Spirit, he comes and gives you the presence of God in the moment that you're in. He gives you the power of God. He fills you with that presence. He enlightens you. He makes you the righteousness of God. So there's no reason to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is powerful. Miles even said that Jesus said, he was like, hey, it's better if I go because who I'm sending is better. Y'all, that, that's insane. We think about that, like we want Jesus so desperately to come in this moment, especially in 2020, we're like, Jesus, just come back, just come, we need you, God, but don't miss that the Holy Spirit is here. Like, don't miss that the Holy Spirit is inside of you and can do something powerful even in the midst of this year and wants to do something powerful through you. Yes, we want Jesus to come back, but don't forget that the Holy Spirit is here with us. I wanna recap a verse that Miles talked about a few I guess last week he talked about Romans 8, so powerful. If you haven't read Romans 8 in a while, circle back because this is where it's at. But in verse 6 of chapter 8, it says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Everybody say life and peace. Isn't that something we crave right now? Life and peace. To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But to set the mind on the flesh is death. Another translation says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life. So we're going to talk today a little bit about the two different winds. There's a wind of the world and there's a wind of the spirit. And today I want to ask everybody this question, whether you're watching online or even in this room, what is your mind governed by? And what wind is guiding your life? Is it the wind of the world? Is it the wind of the spirit? And we're going to follow Acts 27 to kind of look at Paul's life and then look at our own life and see how this relates. In chapter 27 of Acts, they're on, they're setting sail. Paul was a prisoner at this point. If you don't know Paul, a little recap, Paul used to be Saul. He used to be persecutor of Christians. And then he had this radical life change where Jesus got a hold of his life. He had a name change to Paul, and Paul is just a savage for the gospel. I mean, he is absolutely amazing. I mean, Holy Spirit, what's happening? I'm just kidding. I've got to stop saying that. Christian said, stop saying Paul's a savage. I'm like, he was. Like, he was just amazing. Like, he did everything, you know. He just went full force. And uh, I love reading the life of Paul. And at this point, Paul had been preaching in Jerusalem, once again, thrown in prison. Well, they didn't find anything wrong with him. So they're like, send him to Rome. So he's going to Rome at this point. He's a prisoner on the boat. And the wind isn't looking too good in their favor at this point. And so Paul, as a prisoner, speaks up to the centurion guards and tells them this isn't a good idea. But you have to think, he's a prisoner. So what's about to happen kind of makes sense, but I want us to look at it and how it relates to our life. So Acts 27, we're going to start at verse, the end of verse 9. said, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our life. So Paul kind of had this moment. And I don't know that it was the Holy Spirit or that it was just wisdom, because sometimes, you know, we, we could say this might have been the Holy Spirit telling him. It didn't actually say that. Could have just been wisdom knowing, hey, this is not going to be good. The wind is clearly not in our favor. So Paul used wisdom and maybe the Spirit to say, hey, I don't, I don't think this is, this is a good thing to do. We're probably going to lose the ship. We're probably going to lose our cargo. And we're also probably going to lose our life. And listen to what happened. So, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter, and the majority decided to put out to the sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and, southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. 
So they were like, okay, we hear you, but you're a prisoner. Why would we listen to you? This, the pilot said we need to go this way, so we're going to go this way. And I want us to look at that because I want us to think about how the Holy Spirit speaks to us sometimes. Sometimes we just kind of get a nugget of wisdom in our life. We just kind of get, hey, th this is probably not going to be a, a good idea. You probably don't actually want to get in that relationship. You probably don't actually want to go to that party. You probably don't actually want to take that position. Like something in you is a wisdom or a message from God saying that might not be a good idea. But you're looking around and everybody else seems to be fine with it. And it doesn't really seem to be a problem for some people. And people smarter than you or wiser than you are saying, no, it's okay. It's going to be fine. We're going to make it. Let's just do it. Anybody relate to that? Listen to what happens. Verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along creek close to the shore. But soon, take note, but soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster, which literally is winds like hurricane force, it struck down the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. I just want to make a note that the world's wind is very misleading. For about one second, everything looked great. They, the wind blew gently. It was fine. Everything was great. They even thought they obtained their purpose. They were like, whatever. What was he thinking? Everything is smooth sailing. And then boom, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this huge wind comes, and now they're driven by the wind of the world. The wind of the world will be very deceiving. It will come very gently. It'll be a little whisper. And then all of a sudden, you will lose full control. You see, sometimes I feel like we do that. We jump on the ship of an ungodly relationship, and we still expect smooth sailing. We jump on the ship of gossip, and we expect smooth sailing. We jump on the ship of drinking, of partying, of pouring, of sex, and all these things, and we still expect to obtain the purpose that God has for our life, and we're confused when all of a sudden we're at the point where we have no control. When we let the wind guide us, it's not going to seem bad at first, but it will be before you know it that you don't know how to get back. The wind of the world is going to be distracting from your purpose, but the wind of God will always be leading you towards your purpose. It will be guiding you on the route of your purpose. So all of him, them here, they're like, oh my goodness, they're freaking out because now they have no, they can't control the wind at all. They're going, they have no idea where they're going. They're lost. And where it led them was to hopelessness. We read in just a few verses that they lost all hope of being saved. They're like, we're literally not going to make it out of this. Like, we're going to die. And that is what the wind of the world does. It leads you to the point of so much anxiety, of so much insecurity, of so much anxiousness that you think, I'm not going to make it. It leads you to hopelessness. But I think this is amazing because in this moment, Paul stands up and he has a word for everybody on the boat. And the reason why I talked about how I'm not sure that it was the Holy Spirit when, whenever he had this little advice to everybody, he was saying, I, I don't think this is a good idea because it didn't say that. But I do want us to note that although the Holy Spirit might not have said that to him, the Holy Spirit was with him the whole way. Because I do want you to know that you can still be guided by the Holy Spirit and be on a boat like this. Like Paul was guided by the Spirit of God. He was fully um, in the presence of God. He was fully being obedient to God, and he's on the same boat with everybody else. Like you could be fully guided by the Spirit of God, fully in the presence of God, fully obedient to God, and still be in 2020. And you didn't do anything wrong. You're just here. But what do we do in this time? What do we do when we end up on a boat getting tossed by the wind when we didn't have anything to do with that? And yes, we're not perfect. So I will say we do need to check our hearts and say, God, what can I do? What have I done? What do I need to repent from? But at the same time, sometimes life happens and we didn't do anything to deserve it, but we're in this moment. So what did Paul say? Paul stood up and he said, well, you should have listened. You should have listened to me. I totally called this. But then he goes on. He humbles himself. He says, yet, now I urge you to take heart, verse 22, for there will actually be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. I do want us to note that, that Paul said, you're not going to lose your life, but we are going to lose the boat. That's an important thing to think about, guys, because sometimes God's going to get you through something, 
but the stuff that you were carrying on to is not coming with you. So he said, you're going to make it, but you're not, the ship's not going to make it. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid. You must stand before Caesar. I want to stop here for a second. We just talked about how the wind of the world, it led them to anxiousness. It led them to being lost. It led them to being hopeless. But yet Paul on the same boat is sitting here with the angel of the Lord saying, don't be afraid. Paul, you know the Bible talks about that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us one of power, love, and a sound mind. Paul is the guy that said that. So Paul, sitting on the boat amidst everybody, is like, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. I want a power, love, and a sound mind. He's sitting here, and an angel said, don't be afraid. And I just want to encourage you with that, that when the whole world is freaking out, when everything is going wrong, it says in um, Psalms 46, it talks about how even when the winds come, even when everything pretty much goes wrong, it talks about how when nations fall or when kingdoms crumble, that we have to be still and know that God is God. That's like Paul right here. I'm being still. I'm knowing that God is God, and I encourage you with that too. When everything's going wrong, be still and know that God is God, and he's still working. He said, don't be afraid. You must stand before Caesar. In other words, you have a purpose here on this boat. And behold, God has granted you those who sail with you. So then he told the men, take heart, for I have faith in God. It will be exactly as I have been told. I love the faith in this moment. Paul's saying, yes, I see what's going on right now, but my God just told me this. My God just gave me a word. My God just said I still have a purpose. My God just said I'm not done. I have to get to Caesar, and I believe that it's going to be exactly as my God told me, and so we're all going to be okay. We're all going to make it, but the ship's not going to make it. What faith does that take? You know, Obeying and following the voice of God, it's always going to require trust. And the reason it's always going to require so much trust is because it's normally going to contradict the way that the wind of the world's moving. Like, it's normally going to be in the moment that everything's going wrong, that the wind's going crazy, that we're going to get a word from God or we're going to read the word from God and realize actually we're going to be okay. Actually, there's no weapon that could be formed against us that could prosper. Like, actually, we're fine. Actually, God's spirit is going to give us peace. It's going to give us strength. It's going to give us hope in the middle of this moment. And I believe it's going to be that because that's what my God said. So I just encourage this church, like when the whole world is being driven by the wind, to remain driven by the wind of the spirit within you. To say, I have hope that it's going to be exactly what my God said, no matter what else happens on this boat. We go on, and after this happened, you might think, oh, okay, well, this is going pretty good. Now everybody should be fine because an angel just showed up and said, you're going to be okay. But no, everybody's still freaking out besides Paul. And we get down a little further, and yes, we are literally going through all of Acts 27 because I love this chapter, and it is life-changing. I think sometimes, you know, as church, we might say, like, oh, I'm sorry I'm reading so much scripture, but I don't ever want to apologize for reading the word of God because it is, like, it's active and alive. So I want to read this. It says, and fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors and sterns and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, they had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors on the boat. So what they were doing right now is these soldiers were acting like they were going down the back and just laying down some anchors, but they were actually laying down lifeboats. Like they were actually trying to get the rescue boats and escape. They were tricking people. But Paul saw this, and Paul said this in Tyrian soldiers, unless these men stay on the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers went and they cut the ropes of the boat and listen to these words, they let it go. Everybody say, let it go. See, these men were getting afraid because of the crazy winds and so they thought, we're gonna get off of this boat because Paul just said, the ship's not gonna make it. But here's the thing. I heard this one time, it changed my life. The safest place you can ever be is in the center of God's will. Safest place you can ever be in this in the center of God's will. Paul said to them, unless they stay on the ship, they're not going to make it. In other words, I don't know what's going to happen whenever they get out in that crazy wind, but I do know what's going to happen if you stay on this boat. Because God said we're going to make it. But don't get off this boat because this is the center of God's will. This boat has a purpose. This is where the presence of God is. I would not try to escape this boat. 
And I think sometimes the reason why we don't have a fresh wind come in our life is because we still try to use the coping mechanisms of the wind of the world to heal us from whatever we're going through. It's like this. In 2020, in a year like this, we just try to sleep through it. We just try to make it through. We just try to get to things maybe are a little better and then we'll deal with our anxiety. We try to escape the wind of this moment right now instead of letting God heal us in the middle of this. Instead of letting God raise faith up in the middle of this moment. Instead of letting us see what God could actually do if we stay placed where he has us. Do you ever think about the fact that God knew you when he formed you and he numbered your days? I say that because he knew you were gonna be alive here. He knew you were gonna be alive in 2020. The wind of the world is not shocking to him. It doesn't surprise him. He's like literally saying, yeah, this wind is bad. Your ship's not gonna make it, but I have you. I have you in the palm of my hand. I have your day's number. I have purpose for you. I don't, the, the rest of the world, it can, this wind, it can touch everything around this boat. It can even touch this boat, but it cannot touch you because my presence is in you. So yes, it can, things can happen, but if he's in you, he's sovereign. And that doesn't mean bad things won't happen to you, but it means his strength will be within you. Just like I said, when Paul's in this moment, bad things are happening to him, but he has strength, he has peace, he's not afraid, he has joy because he has hope. He knows God is there. He knows God is doing something. So I encourage you, let go whatever your lifeboat is. Let go of whatever your coping is mechanism is and let the Holy Spirit of God, the fresh wind of God come and do something in you right where you're at and just be obedient where you are. Just be obedient where you are. Keep going a little bit longer and at this point, you really think nothing worse can happen, but it gets worse. Again, this really is so much like 2020, it's crazy. Um, Now they're about to be shipwrecked. But it's crazy, right before their shipwreck, there was this like last minute like burst of hope from everybody. They actually like thought they were gonna make it. It says, now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay on a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So I just wanna point this out because at this point, although everything kind of went bad, they kind of had this turnaround point. They were like, actually, because what just happened, and I I didn't read this part, but they all just got to eat before they threw the cargo over. They were all fed. Everybody was kind of fine. And then they see land, and they're like, you know what? I actually think we're going to make it. Like, this is actually going to be great. And right when they see that, they cast the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes and tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made way to the beach. So they're like, Ahoy, we've made it. It's not that bad. We all survived. And then, boom, again, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The boat struck and remained immovable, and the stern was broken up by the surf. Right when they thought, we're going to make it, it's all going to be okay, they actually were shipwrecked. They couldn't move. They were absolutely stuck. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, least any of them swim away. Because remember, they are prisoners. So now the soldiers are like, what do we do? We're just going to have to kill them. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land, and the rest on planks and pieces of the ship. I mean, isn't that a crazy thing to envision? Like their ship, right, it's all these prisoners and they're literally like, they can't even swim. And so they're like breaking off the ship and they're like paddling with the ship. Like this is like the craziest story ever because like so many crazy things have happened. They're supposed to die, but notice all of them, the last verse, were brought safely to the land. Just as the Lord said, your ship's not going to make it, but you're going to make it. God is so faithful. But I want to talk to us about this part because I think it's the shipwreck part that I feel like so many of us can relate to. And this is where it's going to get really real because some of you watching and some of you listening, you're like, okay, which wind am I driven by? Am I driven by the wind of the world or am I driven by the wind of God? And by this point, you should be able to kind of tell by the fruit of your life or the direction that you're going. Do I have purpose? Am I going to the purpose of God or am I totally being distracted from the purpose of God if I'm on the wind of the world or wind of God or if my mind is governed by the flesh? or governed by the spirit. But at this point, I feel like there's another group of people who actually just feel like, I I don't actually know what wind I'm driven by because I just feel like I got the wind knocked out of me. Like, I, I don't actually feel anything. I don't feel any energy. 
Like, I don't feel like I'm driven by the spirit. I don't really know that I'm even driven by the world. I just feel like I totally got the wind knocked out of me. If you never got the wind knocked out of you, you've probably seen people get the wind knocked out of them if you've ever watched college football or soccer or anything. It's that moment where somebody's like running full speed ahead and they normally don't see it coming and then out of nowhere it's like boom. And you just can like see it. It's like you know that moment, you can't breathe. And life's the same way. It's normally when you're running, it's when you think you made it. It's when you think you're almost going to get there. It's when things are actually turning out good and you don't see it coming and then something out of nowhere hits you. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's your own doing. But sometimes you had nothing to do with it. Sometimes it's just so unfair and so unjust. It just hits you. I want to read you what it actually looks like to get the wind knocked out of you. It says, getting the wind knocked out of you. It's called getting the wind knocked out of you, but it turns out that it's not the air that's the problem. I thought that was really interesting that the air is actually not the problem in the moment that you get the wind knocked out of you. It feels like it's the problem. I feel like I can't get air right now, but it's actually not the problem. It's your diaphragm that's the problem. The diaphragm is a dome shaped muscle under your lungs. When you inhale, the diaphragm pulls down to help the air into the lungs. When you exhale, the diaphragm pushes to help the air out of your lungs. So it's not the air that's the problem. Why do I say that and why is that hopeful to me? Because when life hits you so hard, although it feels like you're not going to be able to breathe again, the air is not the problem. The inside of you is the problem. The Holy Spirit is still there. The Holy Spirit is still available. The Holy Spirit is still there the minute that you ask him into your life and into your heart, the minute you ask him to govern your heart, it's the inside of you that needs to be healed. I remember a time that I felt like I got the wind knocked out of me because here's the thing about getting the wind knocked out of you. And you, you might've faced this before and I kind of talked about this with life. There are moments that you physically feel the wind get knocked out of you when nobody really touched you, when nobody pushed you. When you didn't get just completely just sacked, it's just like somebody said something so hurtful that you literally had the same feeling that I don't feel like I can breathe. Personal story of mine, I haven't really shared this with people, but um, I was thinking, I was like, God, when is the time that I felt the wind get knocked out of me? This was the first thing that popped up when I genuinely felt like I can't breathe and I don't really know what tomorrow is gonna look like. And that might sound dramatic, but if you've ever been in this moment, you know exactly the thought, you know exactly the feeling. I had actually been set up with this guy and he was like the nice guy. He was the guy everybody loved. He was a church kid. Everybody was like, you should totally go on a date with him. Um, he knows the Bible so well. He wants to be a preacher. It's funny how people wanna set you up like that. Miles is a good setup person, but, but this, one, this one was not a good setup. Everybody, everybody had high expectation. So I go on this date and, you know, honest though, she's expecting great things. And I, I just thought it was gonna be great, smooth sailing, you know, I did not see anything coming. I didn't really feel like I needed to have any kind of like boundary talk with him because he's a church guy, he loves Bible, he wants to be a pastor, it'll be great. So we go on this date and we get back and, and then he starts kissing me. And then he starts touching me very inappropriately and I get really uncomfortable and it really shocked me. I kind of just remember just being frozen in time. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And the reason I'm sharing that, even though that's super personal, is because I've talked to other people and there's too many girls this has happened to to not say this, to not help people who are still in that frozen moment. And I pushed him away and I said, no. And he looked at me and he smirked and he laughed and he said, hey, listen, there are plenty of other fish in the sea. And then he left. And I cannot lie to you, it felt like the wind got knocked out of me. I felt so belittled. I felt so ugly. I felt so devalued. And I went inside and my roommates were there and I just cried, I couldn't even talk. The next day I just laid on the couch, didn't do anything. And I'm not that person. I'm like, wake up, what are we doing? but I couldn't move, like I was just knocked out because I didn't expect it. It came out of nowhere. And honestly, I was really bitter towards him. You know, sin will knock the wind out of you, but something else that will keep the wind knocked out of you is unforgiveness. And I wanna to talk to y'all about that because we need a fresh wind. 
We really do. We need individuals to have a fresh win and we need a world fresh win. But if you want a fresh win, one, you gotta look at the wind of your life and you gotta get the sin out of your life. You gotta stop jumping on the ships that you know are gonna lead you astray. But two, you gotta forgive the people who did things to you that were totally unfair and totally unjust, that you, you gotta forgive them. And it's so hard and it's so painful, but it's actually required. It's actually something that Jesus instructs that we have to forgive people so that we can love people. We have to forgive people so that we can move on. I wanna read y'all something I think is really, really crazy. It's actually the story, the science behind the crucifixion. It says this, it says, normally to breathe in the diaphragm, the large muscle that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity must move down. Yes, we did just read this when we talked about the wind getting knocked out of you. It's weird how similar this is. This enlarges the chest cavity and air automatically moves into the lungs. To exhale, the diaphragm raises up, which compresses the air. We just talked about this. This is the science behind the crucifixion. Then it says, as Jesus hangs on the cross, the weight of his body pulled down on the diaphragm and the air moved into his lungs and it just remained there. The weight. Do you understand that the weight that Jesus was carrying was the weight of our sin? So who knocked the wind out of Jesus in this moment? We did. Our sin. Somebody else's sin might have knocked the wind out of you. It's weighty, it hurts, it feels hard to breathe. But in this moment, it remained there and Jesus must push up on the nails in his feet, causing him more pain in order to exhale, in order to speak. Air must pass through the vocal cords during exhalation. The gospel notes that Jesus spoke seven times on the cross. So seven times Jesus had to inhale and push up on his nails just so his diaphragm would be able to get the air in to say the words that he was gonna say. And do you know the words that Jesus said? He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is painful to forgive. It is painful to carry sin. It is weighty, it hurts, it literally compresses the air from you. But you know what it also says about getting the wind knocked out of you? Although it is so scary, it's actually not life-threatening. Why is it not life-threatening when you see a moment like that, when somebody gets sacked, when somebody is in that kind of pain? Because it's not the air that goes anywhere. It's the inside of you that needs to heal. Jesus himself, it didn't knock life out of him, it went for three days. But then the power of the presence of God, the spirit of God filled his body and revived him back to life. The wind of God brought him back to life. And in Romans eight, it says the same spirit that brought Jesus back to life, that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit living in you. So the same spirit that brought air into his lungs, that revived him to be able to breathe again, walk again in wholeness and fullness. Yes, he's the son of God, but you were his child. It's also offered to you to revive you. What does revive mean? It, brings, it means to give you new life, to give you a fresh wind, to give you a breath of air. Some of you need that today. There are people today who have recognized, you know what, I am following the wind of God. I am moved by the Spirit of God and I encourage you to keep going with it. Stand firm in your faith. Follow Paul's instruction. Don't be afraid, keep doing that. There are others of you who are saying, you know what, I am totally driven by the wind of the world. I am tossed left and right. I have lost control of my life. I am led in every different direction because I keep jumping on the wrong boat, the wrong ship. I keep thinking it's gonna be fine, but I am ready to jump on the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's you today, or maybe you're the one that was completely knocked to the ground and you've been on the ground. You've been struggling with depression. You've been struggling with so much anxiety. You've been struggling with guilt and shame and all these things, and maybe some of it was not even anything you did, but something somebody did to you unjustly. Today, I wanna ask you to forgive that person. Let the Spirit of God come in you. To forgive that person. Let the Spirit of God come in you to turn and repent from your sin and turn towards Jesus. Why am I saying all this? Why am I passionate all this? Because if we truly want a fresh wind, all of these things we have to understand. 
there's action behind some of these things. There's repentance involved. There's forgiveness that's involved. There's love. There's purpose. There's all of these amazing things. And I do believe what my God says is true. I do believe everything in this word is true and how it is said it will be done. And so I do believe that yes, we're in a hard year. Yes, things are crazy, but God is still moving and God has purposed each one of us in this room and everyone watching online to be here. How do I know that? Well, my good guess is that you're watching, is that you're breathing, is that you have life and that is not a shock to God. So I'm gonna pray over you today and no matter what category you fit in, I just ask that you would bow your head and close your eyes. If you've never let the Spirit of God come in your life, and I'm gonna say to you what my friend said to me, say you just let it happen. Let go of the things that have held you back. Right now in this moment, you might need to repent for some of the things that you've walked through. Repent just means to turn. God, I have done this, I have struggled with this, I have walked through this, but God, right now I turn from that and I turn to you, God. I want nothing to do with that, make me new, God. Maybe some of you, you're sitting there and you're in tears because the wind has been knocked out of you. Invite a fresh breath. Remember, it is not the Holy Spirit that is just, you've gone so far that he can't feel you. No, it's the inside of you. Ask him to heal you. Let him come in you and heal you and revive you. Your life is worth the living. Your life is worth the living. Let a fresh wind come and turn everything around. The future that you have does not have to be determined by the past that you've lived. God, I thank you so much for what you're doing here at Auburn, but I thank you what you're doing globally. I thank you for what you're doing in the kingdom, God. Lord, I pray that your kingdom would come on earth with a fresh wind. I pray that you would revive souls, you would revive spirits, you would revive hearts. God, I pray that you walk with people in this moment through the unforgiveness that they have, that they would take that breath in no matter how painful it is and that breath out of your spirit. I pray that you walk with people who are just repenting of sin and God, you clothe them with your righteousness and tell them that they are your beloved, that they are your child and they are welcome in this home. God, I pray that you do something supernaturally in the next few months before this year ends. God, I don't wanna look back and say 2020 was the worst. I wanna say 2020 is when God moved the most. 2020 was when God became the most evident to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, because it's when we so desperately needed him. God, I pray that you would bring life you would bring restoration, you would bring hope, you would bring freedom, you would set the captives free. I know that's what your spirit comes to do. I know that's who you are. I know that's what you can do. I know that's what you're able to do, God, but even if it doesn't happen now, we trust that it will happen because we know you're good. Father, I thank you for this time. Would we not say amen and go back to our everyday life? Would we continue in this prayer, continue in this asking of the Spirit and move with urgency to revive hearts of others? God, we love you and we praise your holy name. I thank you so much for resurrection life and the power that you have just released on so many people. I believe you set so many people free today, God. It's in your name we pray, amen.